The Iliad, Book 14. Nestor, drinking wine with Machaon, could not help but hear the screaming, and said, Son of Asclepius, what do you make of this? Our boys are shouting much louder by the ships. Now don't get up. Just keep sipping that wine until pretty Hecomede heats up a warm bath and washes off all that clotted blood. Myself, I'll go to a lookout point now. With that, he picked up a metal-plated shield, one of Thrasymedes's that was lying in the hut, and a heavy spear with a owned bronze point. He stepped outside and saw an ugly scene. The Greeks in rout, and behind them the high-hearted Trojans, pouring through the wall. As the dark sea broods with a silent swell, and only a faint premonition of wind is traced on its surface, and no crest forms, until a decisive breeze comes down from Zeus. So the old man pondered which way to go, to join the Greek troops or to get Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, shepherd of his people. He thought it over and went for Agamemnon. The fighting continued and the killing. Armor rang under sword blades and spear points nosed busily past plated shields. The wounded kings were coming up from their ships. Diomedes, Odysseus, and Agamemnon, and met Nestor on the way. Their ships were drawn up far from the battle, on the sand by the Grey Sea, in the first row, and the, the wall was built near the last row, inland. The beach was wide, but could not hold all the ships, so they were drawn up in rows toward the plain, and filled the space between the two headlands. So the kings were coming up together, leaning on their spears to see the fighting, and their hearts were grieved. Old Nestor met them, and was hailed by Agamemnon. Nestor, son of Neleus, glory of our army, why have you left the battle and come here? I fear that Hector will make good on the threats he leveled against us in the Trojan muster, that he would not return to Ilion until he had burnt our ships and killed our men. It's all coming true, just as he said. And the worst part is that all of the Greeks are angry with me, just like Achilles. None of them is willing to defend our ships. And Nestor, the Gerenian horseman, answered, Yes, this is how things are, and Zeus himself, the Thunder Lord, could not make them otherwise, for the wall is down. We put our trust in it as a bulwark for our ships, and now the enemy is at our ships, fighting relentlessly. You cannot even tell in which direction our men are retreating, so confused is their slaughter, the air so filled with the noise of battle up to the sky. We must take counsel in this situation, not enter the battle ourselves. It is not possible for wounded men to fight. And Agamemnon, the warlord. Well then, Nestor, the ships are under attack, and neither the wall nor the trench which we trusted to be a bulwark for our beachhead camp has been of any avail. It must be the pleasure of Zeus Almighty for us to die here, nameless and far from Argos. I knew it when he was favoring the Greeks, and I know now that he is giving the Trojans glory from above and has tied our hands. So this is what I say we should all do now. Let's haul the first line of ships to the water, get them afloat and moor them with anchors until darkness comes. If and when the Trojans stop for the night, we can drag down the rest. It is no shame to flee ruin, even by night. Better to give evil the slip and then be caught by it. Odysseus looked him up and down and said, What kind of thing is that to say? You're a ruined man, son of Atreus, fit to command some ragtag army, but not to rule over men like us to whom Zeus has granted just one thing in life, to wind up wars like skines of wool from youth to old age until the last of us dies. Do you really want to leave Troy behind, the great city that we've suffered so much for? 
Stop that talk before somebody hears you. Words like that should never make it past your mouth. You're a sceptered king commanding the loyalty of an army of Greeks. You must have lost your mind, ordering us to launch ships while the battle is raging. The Trojans, who are winning as it is, will have all their prayers answered, and our army will be utterly crushed. Draw the ships to the sea, and the Greeks will be looking over their shoulders and give up the fight. Your plan will ruin us, Lord Agamemnon. To which Agamemnon briefly replied, That cuts deep, Odysseus. I am not suggesting that the ships be launched against the Achaeans' will. I wish there were someone, young or old, with a better plan than mine. I would welcome that. Diomedes, the bull roarer, had a response. The man is here. No need for a long search. If you are willing to listen, and if none of you will be upset because I am the youngest in years, there's nothing wrong with my lineage. My father was Tydeus, who lies buried at Thebes. My great-grandfather Portheus had three peerless sons who lived in Pleuron and Steep Calydon, Agrios, Melos, and the horseman Oeneus. My father's father, the bravest of the three. My father left home and wandered to Argos, as Zeus and the other gods no doubt willed. He married one of Adrastus's daughters, and lived in a rich house with many acres, in wheat and orchards, and many sheep, and he was the best spearman in all Argos. You will have heard of all this and know it is true, so don't think I'm a coward by birth, and reject anything worthwhile I might have to say. We must go down to the battle, injuries and all, not to fight. We will stay out of range to avoid taking wounds on top of wounds, but to spur the others on and send them in, those who have been on the sidelines, nursing their resentment and failing to fight. They heard him out and agreed. Agamemnon led the way as they started out. Poseidon was not blind to any of this, but went with them disguised as an old man. He took Agamemnon by his right hand and spoke to him words that winged home. Well, son of Atreus, Achilles' dark heart must be laughing now as he sees the panic and slaughter of the Greeks. The man hasn't a shred of sense left. None! Damn him! May some god cripple him! But the Blessed Ones aren't angry with you. Not yet. There's still a chance you will see the Trojan generals raise dust on the wide plain as they beat a retreat from your ships and huts. And as he sped over the plain, Poseidon yelled. So loud it seemed that 10,000 warriors had been enlisted by Ares and shouted at once. And the gods' yell put into each Greek's heart the strength to fight and battle on without pause. Standing on a crag of Olympus, gold-throned Hera saw her brother, who was her husband's brother too, busy on the fields of human glory, and her heart sang. Then she saw Zeus, sitting on the topmost peak of Ida, and was filled with resentment. Cow-eyed Hera mused for a while on how to trick the mind of Zeus, Aegis Holder, and the plan that seemed best to her was to make herself up and go to Ida, seduce him, and then shed on his eyelids, and cunning mind asleep gentle and warm. She went to the bedroom her darling son Hephaestus had built for her, and closed behind her the solid polished doors he had fitted out with a secret latch, and that no other god could open. First she cleansed her lovely skin with ambrosia, then rubbed on scented oil, so immortally perfumed that if the jar were just shaken in Zeus's bronze-floored house, the fragrance would spread to heaven and earth. She rubbed this into her beautiful skin, and she combed her hair and plaited the lustrous ambrosial locks that fell gorgeously from her immortal head. Then she put on a robe that Athena had embroidered for her, pinning it at her breast with brooches of gold. A sash with a thousand tassels circle her waist, 
and in her pierced ears she put earrings with three mulberry drops, beguilingly bright. And the shining goddess veiled over everything with a beautiful veil that was as white as the sun, and bound lovely sandals on her oiled, supple feet. When everything was perfect, she stepped out of her room and called Aphrodite, and had a word with her in private. My dear child, will you do something for me, I wonder, or will you refuse, angry because I favor the Greeks and you the Trojans? And Zeus's daughter Aphrodite replied, Goddess revered as the Cronus' daughter, speak your mind, tell me what you want and I'll oblige you if I possibly can. And Hera, with every intention to deceive, Give me now the sex and desire you use to subdue immortals and humans. I'm off to visit the ends of the earth, and Father Ocean and Mother Tethys, who nursed and doted on me in their house, when they got me from Rhea, after Zeus had exiled Cronus to the regions below. I'm going to see them and try to resolve their endless quarrel. For eons now they've been angry and haven't made love. If I can talk to them and have them make up, and get them together in bed again, they will worship the ground I walk on. And Aphrodite, who loved to smile, How could I, or would I, refuse someone who sleeps in the arms of Almighty Zeus? And with that she unbound from her breast an ornate sash inlaid with magical charms. Sex is in it, and a desire, and a seductive sweet talk that fools even the wise. She handed it to Hera and said, Here, put this sash in your bosom. It has everything built in. I predict you will accomplish what your heart desires. She spoke, and ox-eyed Hera, smiling, tucked the sash in her bosom. Then Zeus's daughter Aphrodite went home, but Hera streaked down from Olympus's peak, used Pieria and Emathia as stepping stones, and sped over the snow-capped mountains of Thrace. Her feet never touched earth. At Athos she stepped on the billowing sea, and so came to Lemnos, Thoas's city, where she met Sleep, the brother of death. She took Sleep's hand and said to him, Sleep, lord of all, mortal and immortal, if ever you've listened to me before, listen now, and I will be grateful forever. Lull Zeus's bright eyes to sleep for me, as soon as I lie beside him in love. I will give you gifts, a handsome throne of imperishable gold, that Hephaestus, my strong-armed son, will build you. It comes with a stool to rest your feet on, as you sit at banquet and sip your wine. Sweet sleep answered her. Goddess revered as Cronus' daughter, if ever this were any other gods of the Eternal, I'd lull him to sleep without any trouble, even if it were the river ocean, which was not, which was rather the origin of them all. But not Zeus. I wouldn't go near the son of Cronus, much less lull him to sleep, unless he himself asked me. I learned my lesson from your last request. That day Heracles, Zeus's high-hearted son, sailed from Troy, having wasted the city. Yes, I slipped my sweet self around the mind of Zeus Aegis Holder, while you brewed up storms at sea to drive his son Heracles off course to Kos, far from his friends. And when Zeus woke up, he was angry throwing gods all over the house, and looking for me especially. He would have pitched me from aether to sea, no more to be seen if night, the mistress, had not saved me. I ran to her, and he relented, reluctant to do anything to offend night swift. And now this, another impossible mission. Hera, the ox-eyed lady, said to him, Sleep, what are you worried about? 
Do you think that Zeus will help the Trojans and be as angry now as he was then for Heracles, his own son? Come on! Look, I'll give you one of the young graces to have and to hold and be called your wife, Pasithea, the object of all your desire. Sleep's mood brightened at this. He said, Swear by the inviolable water of Styx, one hand on fertile earth and the other on glistening sea, so that all the gods below with Cronus will be witnesses that you will give me one of the graces, Pasithea, the object of all my desire. The white-armed goddess Hera agreed and swore the oath, naming all the gods in Tartarus below. Titans, they are called. When she had sworn and finished the oath, the two of them left Lemnos and Imbros and came like swirling fog to Ida, a mountain wilderness dotted with springs. They left the sea at Lecton and headed inland. The treetops quivered under their feet. Sleep halted before Zeus could see him, perching in the highest fir tree on Ida that rose through mist to pure bright air. Sleep nestled in its long needled branches and looked just like the shrill mountain owl, gods called Chalcis, and men, Chimindis. Hera was fast approaching Gargaris, Ida's highest peak, when Zeus saw her, and when he saw her, lust enveloped him, just as it had the first time they made love, slipping off to bed behind their parents' backs. He stood close to her and said, Hera, why have you left Olympus, and where are your horses and chariot? And Hera, with every intention to deceive, I'm off to visit the ends of the earth, and Father Ocean and Mother Tethys, who nursed and doted on me in their house. I am going to see them and try to resolve their endless quarrel. For eons now they've been angry and haven't made love. My horses stand at the foot of Ida, ready to bear me over land and sea. I came here from Olympus for your sake, so you wouldn't be upset that I left to visit Ocean without a word to you. And Zeus, clouds scudding about him. You can go there later just as well. Let's get in bed now and make love. No goddess or woman has ever made me feel so overwhelmed with lust. Not even when I fell for Ixion's wife, who bore Pyrithus, wise as a god. Or Danae, with lovely slim ankles, who bore Perseus, a paragon of men. Or the daughter of far-famed Phoenix, who bore Minos and godlike Radamanthus. Or Semil, or Alcmene in Thebes, who bore Heracles, a stout-hearted son. And Semil bore Dionysus, a joy to humans. Or Demeter, the fair-haired queen. Or glorious Leto, or even you. I've never loved anyone as I love you now. Never been in the grip of desire so sweet. And Hera, with every intention to deceive. What a thing to say, my awesome lord. The thought of us lying down here on Ida and making love outdoors in broad daylight. What if one of the immortals saw us, asleep, and went to all the other gods and told them? I could never get up and go home. It would be shameful. But if you really want to do this, there is the bedroom your dear son Hephaestus built for you with gold solid doors. Let's go there and lie down, since you're in the mood. And Zeus, who masses the clouds, replied, Hera, don't worry about any god or man seeing us. I'll enfold you in a cloud so dense and golden not even Helios could spy on us and his light is the sharpest vision there is. With that, he caught his wife in his arms. Beneath them, the shining soil sprouted, fresh grass and dewy lotus and crocus and hyacinth, soft and thick, 
that kept them up off the ground. And as they lay there, a beautiful golden cloud enfolded them and precipitated drops of glimmering dew. And so the father slept soundly on Gargaron's peak, mastered by sleep and love, and held his wife close. But sweet sleep ran down to the Achaean ships with a message for Poseidon the Earth Shaker. He stood close to them, and his words winged home. Help the Greeks all you want now, Poseidon, and give them their glory, however brief, while Zeus still sleeps, for Hera has bedded him, and I have wrapped him in downy slumber. Saying this, sleep went off to the human world, leaving Poseidon more determined than ever to aid the Greeks. He sprang to the front and cried, Achaeans, are we going to concede victory to Hector so he can take our ships and claim the glory? That's how he's talking, now that Achilles is nursing his wrath on the beach by his hulls. But we won't miss him too much if the rest of us all pull together and help each other. Now here's what I want all of us to do. Get the biggest and best shields in the army. Strap on full metal helmets. Arm yourselves with the longest spears you can find. And let's move out. You have my word that Hector, no matter how eager he is, won't hold his ground. Now let's go and exchange gear if you have to, so that our best fighters have the biggest shields. He spoke... They listened, and they did as he said. And the kings, though wounded, Diomedes, Odysseus, and Agamemnon, marshaled them, going through the ranks and switching armor, so that the best men were using the best gear. When their bodies were covered with burnished bronze, they moved out, led by Poseidon, who held in his clenched fist a terrible sword its long edge like lightning, a weapon outlawed in mortal combat, sheer terror for men. Opposite him, Hector marshaled the Trojans, and the two of them tightened the cords of war, Poseidon tossing his dark blue mane, and Hector standing in a cone of cold light, while the sea surged up to the Greek ships and huts. The two sides closed with a pulsating roar, the pounding of surf when arching breakers roll in from the deep under painful northern winds, or the hissing roar of a forest fire when it climbs the hills to burn all the woods, or the howling of wind when it is angry with oaks and moans and shrieks through their leafy branches. We'll give you some idea of the uncanny noise the Greeks and Trojans made when they clashed. Hector struck first, a spear cast at Ajax, who was in his line of fire. He didn't miss, but the spear hit Ajax where his two belts, one for his shield, one for his silver-studded sword, formed a protective cross over his skin. Angry that he had made a good throw for nothing, Hector backstepped into the ranks of his army, avoiding fate. But as he withdrew, Big Ajax picked up one of the stones that had rolled underfoot. There were many of these, used as chocks for the ships, and caught Hector on the chest, above his shield's rim, just under the neck, and sent him spinning like a top. He fell as a tree falls, an oak tree blasted by lightning from Zeus. The tree is uprooted and the air reeks of brimstone, and no one who sees this from close up has any desire to be near Zeus's thunderbolts ever again. So Hector fell to the ground in the dust. The spear was knocked from his hand, but his shield and helmet flew up in the air and then came down, clattering on the rest of his embellished armor. The Greeks ran up screaming with delight, hurling javelins thick and fast and hoping to drag him off, but they couldn't touch him. All Troy's best crowded around their hero, Polydamas, Aeneas, Agenor, Glaucus, Sarpedon, the Lycian commander. No one neglected Hector. 
they circled him with shields and lifted him up and away from war's toil, until they brought him to the rear of the battle, where his horses stood with his charioteer and rig, which took him groaning back toward the city. But when they reached the ford of the Xanthus, the beautiful swirling river that Zeus begot, they lifted him from the chariot to the ground and poured water on him. This brought him around, his eyes opened, and kneeling on his knees he vomited up a cloud of black blood. Then he sank back to the ground, and darkness covered his eyes. The blow still mastered his spirit. When the Greeks saw that Hector was gone, they remembered how much they loved to fight. First to draw blood was Oelian Ajax. A quick leap and thrust of his spear brought down Satnius, son of Enops, and a peerless naiad who lived in the river, the Satniosis, where he tended his flocks. When Ajax's spear hit him on the flank, he fell on his back and became the center of some hard fighting. Polydamus, Panthous' son, came up to help him and put his spear through the right shoulder of Prothoenor, Arielysis' son. The spear weight carried it clear through, and he fell to the earth, clawing at the dust. Polydamus gloated over him loudly. Ha! Another great throw from the strong hand of the heroic son of Panthous, and another Greek has my spear in his flesh. Use it as a crutch on your way down to hell. This boast pained the Greeks, no one more so than Telamonian Ajax, who was closest to the man when he fell. Ajax's bright spear was in the air instantly, hurtling at Polydamus, who managed to dodge both its point and his death. No matter, the spear lodged in Archilochus, Antenor's son, whom the gods wanted to die. Just where the neck splices into the spine, at the topmost vertebra, the spear blade sheared through the double tendon. His mouth and nose hit the earth before his legs and knees. It was Ajax's turn to call to Polydamus. What do you think, Polydamus? Was this man worthy to be killed in return for Protheanor? He wasn't simply a nobody, was he? Looks like he might be Antenor's brother, or his son. There's a family resemblance. He knew perfectly well who it was. The Trojans felt their chests tighten. Then Acamas, straddling his brother's body, stitched his spear through Pro Promachus, the Boeotian, who was trying to drag the corpse by its feet into the clear. Acamas was exultant. Try fighting sometime instead of issuing threats. We're not going to be the only side to suffer. We're going to give as good as we get. How do you like the nap Promachus is taking, courtesy of my spear? I didn't waste any time collecting the price for my brother's blood. That's what family is for, to beat off ruin. The Greeks winced when they heard this. No one more so than the warrior Peneloas. He charged, and when Acamas did not wait for his onslaught, he hit Ilioneus instead. This man's father was Forbis whom Hermes loved more than any other Trojan, and who had the flocks and wealth to prove it, but only one child, Ilioneus. Peneleus's spear went through his eye socket, gouging out the eyeball and going through the nape of the neck. Ilioneus stretched out his hands as he settled slowly to earth. Peneleus took out his sword and hacked at his neck, severing the head, helmet and all. The great spear was still stuck in his eye socket. Peneloas held it up like a poppy, and showing it to the Trojans, said, Kindly take word to Ilioneus' parents to lament their prince in his family's halls, as the wife of Promachus, Alegonor's son, with lament the absence of her cherished husband when the Greeks return on their ships from Troy. He spoke and the Trojans began to tremble, eyes searching for an escape from death. Muses who dwell on Olympus, tell me, who was the first Greek to bear away spoils once Poseidon had turned the battle's tide? Telamonian Ajax, who wounded Hyrtius, 
son of Girtius, leader of the Mycenaeans, and Antilochus despoiled the Falces and Mermeris. And Meriones slew Maurice and Hippotion, and Teucer stripped Prothoon and Periphetes, and the son of Atreus wounded Hyperenor in the flank, and when the bronze clove through, all the bowels spilled out, and his soul rushed through the gaping wound, and night covered his eyes. But Ajax, Oileus's swift son, killed the most. No one could chase down men in a rout faster than he when Zeus makes them panic. <laughs>